to start this morning a little different, I think, than we've ever started a Bible study. We're going to start, and this is going to be something that's on our minds throughout this whole time, by reciting the third commandment and its meaning from the small catechism. So, this is how I do it. You all can do it however you want with your own kids, but this is how I do it. I will say something, you guys will repeat after me. Ready? Okay. What is the third commandment? What is the third commandment? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? <laughs> what does this mean? We should fear and love God. We should fear and love God. So that we do not despise preaching. So that we do not despise preaching. And his word. But hold it sacred. But hold it sacred. And gladly hear and learn it. And gladly hear and learn it. Okay, now you can stop repeating after me. <laughs> now, that's how I start with my kids at home learning the commandments, learning the small catechism. And then gradually they repeat the whole, the whole meaning. I'll, I'll say the whole meaning, and then they'll repeat it. And then, gradually, they, I'll just say, what does this mean? And then they'll tell me what it means. So that's how we do it at our house. And the reason I'm telling you this is because by the end tonight, or by the end of uh, this Sunday school, it won't be tonight, I promise, um, I'm going to encourage you all to take this home and memorize just... Just the third commandment and its meaning with your family. But let's start with prayer. By your word and spirit, draw us away from our restless labor, that we might find rest in you alone, merciful God. Grant that fearing and loving you above all things, we may never despise the preaching of your word of life, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, This morning, I kind of am going a little, little off script, just a tad, because I want to start where, where this actually starts. Today, we're going to talk about the um, the cleaning up the the cleaning of the temple or the clearing, whichever one you want to say. But this actually starts all the way back in the Old Testament. So let's look and see what God had to say through his prophets about this particular situation. Um, let's read Malachi 1 through 5. Um, and um, How about somebody just read 1 and 2, and then I'll move it up. Would somebody read 1 and 2, please? Three, one, and 2. Behold, I send my message. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller soap. He will sit as a refiner's oh. Let's, let's stop there for just a second. I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, does, uh, does anybody know what a refiner's fire does? Purifies metal. Purifies metal. Pure, purifies metal. Does anybody know what Fuller's soap does? <laughs> it cleanses cloth to, to allow it to be dyed more readily. It bleaches it, it gets all the impurities out of it, and it cleanses it. So it's white as snow. Oftentimes you'll hear Fuller's soap being talked about whenever we're talking about white as snow. So anyways... Um, that's just a, an aside, but um, could somebody read uh, 3 to 5? He will sit as a refiner and purifier of sil silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and he will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. Then, offering, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord. In the days of old, he has in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against 
sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner, and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Thank you very much. Okay, so, as we read through the cleansing of the temple, I want you guys to keep this in the back of your mind. Okay, because this was prophesied about Christ, obviously. We're talking about Christ cleansing the temple today, so that's why I brought it up. But, the next thing I want to do to start us off is if you could look at your notes. As a table, I would like you guys to, just, just there at your own table, I would like you all to answer the opening reflection. Brainstorm a list of the top five things you think most people think of when they hear the word church. Okay? The top five things people think of when they hear the word church. Gathering. And write them down at least on one piece of paper. One more minute. If you need more time than that, that's okay. You're still going to just go. 30 more seconds. Ten more seconds. Am I making anybody feel uncomfortable? <laughs> yes. Yep. That's that's my uh, my dad minute. My dad seconds. Okay. Let's just go around, and I just want to know what your top one thing was from each table. What's your top thing? Prayer. Okay. Prayer. Got prayer. Worship. Worship. It's Sunday. The cobbles are serving, and we have a feast. <laughs> Servant. Okay. Worship. Weddings. Weddings. That's a good one. Music. Sundays. Yeah, there you go. Our favorite day. There you go. No work. We can go to church and do whatever we want. Uh, forgiveness of sin, salvation. Forgiveness of sin, salvation. We were thinking of those who think it's uh, antiquated or hypocritical. Yeah, some think that it's antiquated or hypocritical. Yeah. Is where we get baptized. Where we're baptized, where we receive the, all of the gifts of God. House of God. House of God. Yeah. Gathering of people. Okay. We have a lot of positives and not too many negatives, but there, there are negatives. Um, but let's keep that in mind as we go. Um, so let's read John 2, 13 and 14. If somebody would read that. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were so 
like oxen and sheep and pigeons. And the money changers sitting there. Now, um, a little background information. John is the only book that puts the cleansing of the temple at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Now, a lot of people have said, a lot of uh, different commentators have said, well, John probably just kind of rearranged everything and he just put it where he wanted. But it's important to realize that if you look just above this, 12 says, After this he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for not a few days. Then it goes right into the text that we're studying today. And this is kind of important because John doesn't write this as if he's mixing things up. John writes this as if Jesus went down to the temple on the first Passover of his ministry and he cleaned the temple. So, if you read in your study Bible, it might give you some thoughts like, oh, you know, he, he probably mixed it up or there was probably only one cleansing. But actually, there were probably two cleansings. John's cleansing at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, which actually points us to Malachi 3, 1 to 5. It says, he went immediately to the temple. This was the first thing that Jesus did, the first preaching he did in his ministry, according to John. Um, so that's important for us to know. Um, it was his first public act of ministry, is, is, is what they say here. Um, but um, that's important because oftentimes people might want to, um, to question how the Bible was written. But as Lutherans, we have to realize that the Bible is the inspired word of God. It was written the way the Holy Spirit wanted it to be written. John says that he cleansed the, te the temple at the beginning of his ministry, so therefore we believe that he cleansed the temple at the beginning of his ministry. He, Matthew says he cleansed it in the last Passover of his ministry, so we believe he did it twice. Um, okay, a couple of other things about this situation is... Um, there's nothing too wrong about selling oxen, sheep, and pigeons. Um, most likely, they were selling these in the Gentiles' court. Um, and it, it, over time, it had just become that. That's what they did, because people would come from afar. They wouldn't bring their own. But the problem was that it was just a fair. It was just, it was just craziness. Um, and there is something wrong here that you don't notice. Um, the money changers. So people would come from all parts of the Roman um, Empire, and they would bring their own money, but their money had an image on it. And they weren't allowed to use money with images. They were only allowed to use Jewish money in the temple. They were only allowed to use it to buy those oxen, to buy those sheep, whatever it is. But the biggest problem comes, and that sounds all good and okay, that's, I'm glad they were doing that. But the problem was they were gouging people to change their money. And so Jesus, knowing these people's hearts, realized that this is just a farce. And so therefore, he cleanses the temple, as we heard in Malachi, like a refiner's fire. Then... He goes on to teach, but let's, let's stop there for a second, and let's look at our first uh, reflection question from John 2, 13 to 14. Um, keeping in mind that exchanging money and buying and selling animals within the temple itself was a misguided practice, 
How do Christians today sometimes turn well-intended church practices into idolatry? So let's hear what you guys have to say about this. This misguided practice that Jesus scourges the temple for, how do we Christians today sometimes turn well-intended church practices into idolatry? By, by doing work. Okay. Sometimes people who are doing work for the church, they might think that that work is a good work. That somehow they're going to receive salvation for it. In actuality, through the Holy Spirit, the good works that we do are just that. Good works. And that's okay. But when it becomes this idea that my work is going to save me, that can become a problem. What are some others? Um, <clears throat> worshiping statues. Sure. Uh-huh. Yep. There's nothing wrong with us having a Jesus statue out here, but once we start worshiping it, once we start, um, you know, wanting to pray to it and kiss it, then it becomes an idol. Yeah, absolutely. Getting excited to come here to church, not necessarily for church, but for <laughs> the other things that go on, the social things. Um, I'm not, we're, not to say that that's not wonderful, but we're here for that. <laughs> Anything else? To some extent, in some churches, the music like, style becomes a concert and versus listening to praise. Right. Yeah, so, so in some churches, um, their, their music actually becomes their idol. It's going to be loud, and it's going to be in your face, and it's no longer to praise God, unlike um, the holy hymnody that we have here at church. Yeah, maybe the pastor is so cool, or he's so, you know, I don't know what the cool word is nowadays, sorry. <laughs> I'm not that guy. But um, that everybody just has to come to see him, and he becomes their idol. It's not what he, it's not the words that he gives them from Holy Scripture. One more. Appearance. What's that? Appearance. How you dress, how you look. Absolutely. Um, he said appearance. When it becomes all about, I got to make sure that I dress up perfectly so that everybody sees me and knows that I'm a really good Christian. It's no longer about Christ, it's about me. All right. So, I guess in some of our churches, we might need a refiner's fire or fuller's soap also. Um, let's go. With John 2, 15 to 17. If somebody would read 15 all the way down to the end of the paragraph. And making a whip of horns, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the oil of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told, and he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And his disciples remembered that it was written. Yeah, um, so Jesus, filled with zeal, makes a whip of cords. These cords had likely been the cords that were around maybe the oxen legs or the sheep's legs to keep them where they were. Um, those, those animals that were for sacrifice, and he drives them out. Now, just to point out, the Lamb of God is in the temple. Do we need another sacrifice? No. No, so he drives them out. Now, no one will understand this right at first. The same goes for the pull the the you know the the pouring over of the money lenders. Um, do we need that cash exchange anymore? No, the one who's more precious than silver and gold is standing there. 
Um, now, a lot of people want to say, well, look, Jesus got angry. So that means he must have sinned. But there's a difference between the zeal that Jesus was filled with and his righteous anger and the anger that spills over from our sinful heart. Jesus, he saw what they were doing to his father's house. He knew that he was the Lamb of God, and in his righteous anger, he cleaned his father's house. So don't think that just because Jesus got mad in the temple means I can get mad at home and do whatever I want to do. It's a totally different situation. So, if we look at our reflection question, how are Jesus' actions here about both his desire for proper worship practice and God's fulfillment of the Old Testament worship system in Jesus? I gave those away. <laughs> Anyways, let me, let me hear what you guys have to say. What was the question? Yep. <laughs> Sorry. How are Jesus' actions here about both his desire for proper worship practices and God's fulfillment of the Old Testament worship system in Jesus? Let's just go with one of those. First, how are Jesus' actions here about his desire for proper worship practices? He was taken away, the, he was taken away distractions too. What's that? What 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 would you say it is? Yeah, yes, I, did you hear what he said? Um, because Jesus was the one foretold in the Old Testament, he was the one sacrifice for all sins. Therefore, his zeal to clean, cleanse the temple was about proper worship practice and a fulfillment of the Old Testament um, worship system in one. So that, that's a good point. Um, we heard here, um, it's just to get rid of all of these distractions. And I think that pointing to Jesus. So, I think, let's go on to John 2, 18 to 22. All right, if somebody could read John 2, 18 to 22. seeing Jesus um, empty the temple, cleanse the temple, um, the Jews are probably pretty upset because that money changing and probably all the selling of the different animals makes them a pretty penny. And so they question Jesus, and um, when they say, what sign do you show us for doing these things, what they're really saying is, what authority do you have to do such a thing. Are you a man of God? Are you a prophet? 
Are you going to tell us some prophecy or give us some magical sign? But as we know, Jesus doesn't just give his signs to the Jews. Especially whenever it says Jews here, he's not talking about the regular everyday Jew. He's talking about the Pharisees, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, um, the Levites, the priests. Um, he's talking about those Jews. Um, and so Jesus does give them a sign. It does give them a prophecy. They just don't understand it. Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. Now, they're standing in the, the temple, but what is Jesus talking about? His body. His body. The temple which God dwells in. Um, one of the things that you might know from, from, um, from the Old Testament is the second temple, um, did, did God ever come and, and, and show his, his glory in the second temple? Did he sit down in the temple on the Ark of the Covenant like he did in the first temple? No, he didn't. And so, God has shown his glory in his son, Jesus Christ, the, the true temple. Um, the Old Testament promised a Messiah, God with us, and yet the Jews were not looking for a Messiah, they were looking around at their empty temple. So then, later, when he says this, the Jews say to him, well, this temple has taken 46 years. How are you going to raise it in three days? Obviously, they're thinking of two different temples. But later, whenever he dies and he's raised again, the disciples realize, oh, he wasn't talking about the temple in Jerusalem, he was talking about himself. Um, and uh, some would say that they probably didn't even realize this until Pentecost, when they received the Holy Spirit and they could more fully put together all of the words that Christ had said. Um, as we've said in the past before, without the Holy Spirit, we have no way to understand the words of God, the word of God. Um, and so as they received the Holy Spirit, these things would have started to make sense. Also, on the road to Emmaus, some of the disciples, they were really sad because, well, Jesus was dead. Even though they had heard about his resurrection, and then Jesus himself puts everything together from the, from the beginning of the Old Testament all the way to all the words that he had, speaking, he had spoken. Um, so, it was no wonder that the, the Jewish leaders couldn't understand what Jesus was talking about. Um, so, Knowing what you know about the importance of the temple through God's plan of salvation, which was sacrificial, um, in what ways are Jesus' words about his body being the temple so significant for us as his people today? Jesus as the temple of God, how is that significant for us today? He is our sacrifice. He is the sacrificial lamb of God. Yeah, it, to me, it reflects back to the Old Testament of the original uh, sacrificial system and everything that God instituted with uh, Abraham and Moses. And that uh, they didn't have a perfect lamb to sacrifice. Jesus was only that sacrifice. Yep, 
God. So did you hear that? Back in the sacrificial system in the Old Testament with Moses, there was no perfect lamb that could be sacrificed for all sins. It was only Jesus who became that sacrifice for all. What about when we receive Holy Communion? That's his body and blood. It's not just a remembrance, as some would want to say, but it's literally for the forgiveness of our sins. Now, we don't sacrifice Jesus right there, but we receive his body and blood because he was sacrificed on the cross. Now that I've kind of given you a little nudge, Go a little deeper. What are some other things? Uh, Jesus is the center of our worship. And he said, without his body, you cannot do nothing. He said that Jesus is the center of our worship, and without his body, we could not do anything. And that's true. Um, interestingly enough, uh, is this something, is this important? No, you can raise it. That's okay. what this there. Okay. Um, one of my favorite professors, um, Dr. Gieschen, uh, said to us one time, um, in the first class that we were in, Kia and I were in it together, um, and it, it, it just it was just amazing. It just blew my mind. Um, Dr. Gieschen said, if you look at the Old Testament, out here in the Old Testament, there's a lot going on, but as it comes to the end of the Old Testament, it starts to get a little bit narrower until Matthew. And in Matthew, some of you might not know this, but uh, when Matthew wrote his, his, uh, his book, his gospel, um, some pe people think that he might have been thinking that he was writing an end to the Old Testament. Okay, so as the Old Testament, the congregation in the Old Testament they were looking forward to Christ. Everything that happens in the Old Testament, all of it, narrows down into this one situation, Christ. Now, they even call the Old Testament Israelites the congregation. Now, in the New Testament... All the way up to Acts, and then further to us, we are all looking back at Christ. The whole Old and New Testament are all about the one Lamb of God who was sacrificed for the sins of all. So I, I kind of always thought that, that was really neat. And I'll probably remind you all of that many different times, and I'm not apologetic for it. <laughs> yes? Yeah. There's a church and there's the church. 
There you go. Right. And, 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 and another thing that I would say, um, just, just to her point, is the temple of God with the Holy of Holies is no longer necessary. And even on the cross when Christ died, the curtain that, that separated the Holy of Holies from everything else was ripped in half to show that now we have access through Christ himself. We no longer have to go to the one temple. Um, so, yeah. I was going to say, but it's the other one that we noticed in the years. People had to go to Jerusalem to take part in that practice because of Christ's been here. You know, it's come already. He is everywhere. So we don't have to go to Jerusalem now to, to do our thing. We can do it at church. Yeah. Um, so, let me just ask you. Um, why do you think it was that uh, that I went with the third commandment when talking about the cleansing of the temple? Why did I read to you all and make you all repeat the third commandment and its small catechism meaning? Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, because of what Jesus did for us, the Sabbath no longer is a Levitical law that says we have to do it on Saturday, on the seventh day. What day do we do the Sabbath? Sunday. Sunday, which is the, the eighth day, the day that Christ was, Christ rose from the dead. Um, could we do it? What about on Monday? We do it on Monday. Is that okay? Yes, because, because Christ opened the Holy of Holies to us, and because each of our churches is, Christ is present in his body and blood, in his word. When you hear his word, that is a Sabbath. Um, it's not just the hearing, but it's also the not despising. So these people, they had, they had this idea of what temple sacrifice should have been like. Just like I think most of us have this idea of what church should be like. You know, and most of us would probably say that, you know, I need to get to church as often as I can, you know, once a week whatever. Um, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to thank God. I'm going to bring in my, my, uh, my donation to the church, my tithe, my offering, whatever you want to say. Um, but how often do you realize that that's not what church is about? Church is about what God can do for you. What God does do for you. That's not what the temple sacrifices were about. The whole reason that God gave them the temple sacrifices 
was so that they could be in the presence of God. Because as in unclean, as, as sinners, however you want to put it, if they were in the presence of God, they would die. God gave them the law so that they could be within his presence. We have church not so that we can come and do something for God. We have church so that when things fall apart in our life, when, when our, who knows, when somebody that we love passes away, whatever the situation is, we go here and God feeds us with his word. God feeds us with his body and blood. God is the one who actually is serving us. Now, we do give him our thanks, but that's not the reason we go to church. It's because we need God. So, to not despise preaching and the word really is to not make church an idol for ourselves. I can go to church whenever I want. I can miss this week. It's fine. I'll make it up. That's despising the gifts that God wants to give you. When the pastor, I, I, I will raise my hand and say that I have this problem. When the pastor is preaching his sermon, sometimes it's hard. My mind wanders. That's despising his word. But in the prayer that I prayed, we know that we are going to fail. We know that we have sin within us. And so we do still come so that we can receive forgiveness of sins. Holy absolution is, is just what it is. It's very holy. Anytime you need forgiveness of sins, the pastors are there. But especially as often as you're in church, you receive it. So anyways, I'm sorry, that was my hobby horse. I would suggest, yeah. Uh, his, his body is one as a church, but as, as the, a lot of parts of the church. When we come together as one with Christ, we use our gift to each and every one of us to help each other. So did you hear me say that... Uh, that the Lord's body is one, and as a church, we are the Lord's body also. And as we come together, the gifts that we have, we help each other. Um, and last week, I think it was, we sang such a wonderful hymn. Um, it said um, something to the effect of, if he, the head, rose, surely he's not going to leave his members in the ground. Members as in hands and feet, as in us. Um, so, as Christ also rose from the dead, we too will in the, on the last day rise from the dead. Um, does, uh, so, what I would encourage you all to do this week, I know that, uh, that this might seem a little um, silly because everybody's done it, but you should always remember that the, the small catechism is for you. Not just for the kids, but for the kids, for the, for the babies, for the adults. So I would challenge you to, with your family, memorize just this one part. The third commandment and its meaning. Um, I'm not going not gonna to test you. Just, I would challenge you to do that. Um, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory,